Thank you, Brother Chuck. That was beautifully and wonderfully done. Find the third chapter of the book of the Revelation, will you please, this morning? I'm going to preach this evening's message this morning. I have been preaching through the seven churches in the book of the Revelation, a series of messages, and I just felt that perhaps I ought to preach this message this morning. Maybe you'll know why after I finish. Because there's some, I'm afraid, that would need the message this evening, and the very fact that they need it is the reason they'll not be here this evening to hear it. You'll understand more about what I'm saying a little later. So I'm, I'm speaking to you today on the sin of lukewarmness. The sin of lukewarmness. I'm reading today from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. There is a sin, figuratively speaking, that nauseates God. There is a sin that Christians may commit that makes God want to regurgitate. This passage that says, I will spew thee out of my mouth, literally means, I will vomit thee out. There is a sin that Christians may commit that makes God sick on his stomach. It is the sin of lukewarmness. Before we get into that, I want you to notice how the Lord introduces himself here in verse 14, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Three things we learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, he is the confirming Christ. He is the Amen. Did you know that Amen is one of the names of Jesus? He is the Amen. And Amen is a confirmation. It means truly, truly, very, very confirming, confirming, is this word, Amen. And Jesus Christ is God's confirmation to all that he said. The Bible says the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. He is the confirming Christ. He is the proof that God will keep all of his promises. But not only is he the confirming Christ, he is the convicting Christ. He is the faithful and true witness, verse 14 tells us. He will either testify for us or he will testify against us. He is the convicting Christ who convicts us of our sin or who will convict us to our judgment. He is the convicting Christ. And then he is the controlling Christ. He is the beginning, the Bible says, of the creation of God. Now, never think for one little moment that that means that he's the first thing that God created. He was never created. There never was a time when he was not. It means that all things have their beginning in him. All created things are created by him and for him. And the Bible says this very clearly and very plainly. And that tells me he is the controlling Christ. I want to tell you not a blade of grass grows without his permission. Not a speck of dust will move without his okay. All things are in his hands. And so it is this Christ who is speaking to us today. Now here is the sin of lukewarmness. And I want you to notice three things about this sin with me this morning. I want you to notice the curse of it. I want you to notice the cause of it. And I want you to notice the cure for it. Now what is the curse of lukewarmness? What do we mean by lukewarmness? Now lukewarmness, lukewarmness is a state of being where something is too cold to be hot. And it is too hot to be cold. It is too cold to boil. It is too hot to freeze. And therefore it is insipid and nauseous. It speaks of indifference and lackadaisical attitude. When a person uh, uh, takes ingest poison and they want to make that person regurgitate, generally they say, uh, give them something lukewarm. I've even read on some bottles and some cans where they say, 
lukewarm dishwater. Well, that makes someone regurgitate. Any kind of dishwater is offensive to me. But uh, you take uh, lukewarm dishwater and take it down. You know that you don't mind hot tea and you don't mind cold tea, but you don't like anything that is lukewarm. It's nauseous. It makes you want to regurgitate. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about lukewarmness. Now, to whom is God speaking? Well, in the first place, he's not speaking to the out-and-out sinner, the one who is cold. He's not talking about the atheist. He's not talking about the agnostic. He's not talking about the unbeliever. He's not talking about the person who takes his puny fist and boldly, brazenly, bragglingly shakes that fist in the face of God. Oh, he has reserved his judgment for these people. He has reserved his anger for these people. He has reserved his wrath for these people if they don't get saved. But they don't make him nauseous. They don't make him sick. He's not talking about them. Well, he's not talking about the on fire Christian either. He's not talking about those who are hot. He's not talking about those who have a burning, blazing, passionate, emotional love for the Lord Jesus Christ, whose hearts are aflame with love for the Lord Jesus. He's not talking about the going, growing, growing Christian. He's not talking about that person either. He is talking about that person who is saved, who is a child of God, but is a, what I call a cold dishwater Christian, a lukewarm, good Lord, good devil, half-hearted, self-satisfied, pussy-footing, fist-straddling Christian. Those are the ones that he's talking about, and uh, those are the ones, he says, that make him sick on his stomach. How is lukewarmness manifested? Well, let's just check up. Think how many people are lukewarm about their sanctification. How many people do you know who have a genuine, burning passion to be pure and to be clean, to be holy? Now, I know that uh, we Baptists don't believe in sinless perfection, but it's not a very edifying sight to see some cigarette-smoking, uh, mall rolling who has, uh, uses uh, bad language and who uh, frequents places of worldly amusement uh, to criticize other people who believe in sinless perfection. I would to God that Baptists were as much afraid of sin as they are sinless perfection. And I would to God that we had a law in our heart for some good old-fashioned holiness. God says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. The Bible says, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. But no longer today can you tell the difference between the child of God and the child of the devil. They go to the same places, they dress alike, they watch the same amusements, they drink the same things, they smoke the same things, and yet they call themselves children of God. Oh, it's not that they're all that bad. They don't steal, but neither do they pay their debts always, and neither do they always return those things that they borrow, and they will even pay the rent if the landlord doesn't do something to upset them and give them an excuse for not doing it. Oh, they're not that bad. They don't commit adultery, but they do sit around watching by television and movies, those that do, and they get their entertainment that way. And some ladies are addicted to these soap operas as the stomach pumps or as the world turns or whatever it is. But they wouldn't do those things. But they get their entertainment watching those things. They wouldn't commit fornication, but they tell filthy jokes and laugh and giggle about people who break the seventh commandment that says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Or they wouldn't tell black lies, but they tell white lies. They say, I'm glad to see you when they're not glad to see you. They say, I'll pray for you when they know good well they will not pray for you. Or they wouldn't curse. They wouldn't blaspheme. But their speech is seasoned with things like heck and gosh darn and gee whiz, euphemistic expressions for Christ and hell and damnation and Jesus Christ, second-handed cussing. They're not all that bad. They're just not all that good. They're not all that down on purity. They're just not all that up on it. They're like that little girl who prayed, Father, make me good, not too good, just good enough so I won't get a spanking. Lukewarm about sanctification. I know some
some of you who are lukewarm about this matter of service. I thank God for Bellevue Sunday school teachers. But how many Sunday school teachers do we have that literally pray and intercede for their classes? That have a broken heart. That know who the saved are and who the unsaved are in their classes. That know the needs, the cares, and the burdens of those classes. How many of you study and weep and pray over your lesson until you come filled with the Holy Spirit of God? How many preachers in the world today, including this one standing here this morning, preach filled with the Spirit with a heart of flame, with a broken heart, ready to preach in power and ready to preach in authority? God forgive us for our lukewarm preaching. Somebody has described the average church as a mild-mannered man standing in front of some mild-mannered people exhorting everybody to be more mild-mannered. Oh, give us some men with brimming eyes and burning lips and hearts of flame who will preach as a dying man would preach to a dying man. God forgive our lukewarm preaching. I'll tell you why there's so many bored people in the pews, because there's so many bored preachers in the pulpits. People who don't have a heart, a fire, and a place for the Lord Jesus Christ. How many singers, when they sing, sing with the unction and the anointing and the power of God? Oh, when preachers sing, oh, when people sing, they want to sing just the right note. They want to have just the right timing. They want to stand just right. They want to form their words just right. They sing for edification. They sing for amusement. They sing for entertainment. But how many of them sing with unction and power, with brokenness and blessedness? How many of them sing with hearts that are filled and overflowing with the Spirit of God? Our singing ought to bless the saved. Our singing ought to warn the lost. Our singing ought to be in the Spirit. It is a sin for anyone to try to sing in the choir or anywhere else who's not filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, be not drunk with wine when it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And the very next verse says, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's the way we're to sing, filled with the Holy Spirit. There should be a gladness. There should be an urgency. There should be feeling, yes, and indeed sometimes there should be tears when we sing. For we're singing with our heart aflame for the Lord Jesus Christ. How many are lukewarm not only about uh, their service, but how many are lukewarm about the scriptures? If I would ask you how many of you believe the Bible is the word of God, most of these hands would go up. And yet there's a lukewarmness about this book. We do not love it. We do not read it. We do not study it. We do not saturate our souls with it. Many of you do not spend 10 minutes a day with the Bible. Many of you spend more time with the newspapers than you do with the Word of God. You know it is true. When Peter Lord was here, he asked a question. I won't ask it again. How many of you believe everything you read in the newspapers? Let me see your hand. No, not a one of them. How many of you believe all the Bibles the Word of God? Let me see your hand. Now, I'm not going to ask you a third question because it would be embarrassing. The third one would be how many of you spend more time with the newspapers than you do with the Bible? What is wrong with somebody who spends more time reading something that he doesn't believe than he does reading something that he does believe? Listen, many of you have been Christians for a long time. You do not even know how many books there are in the Bible. You couldn't name them if you like to put upon it, and I could embarrass you by asking you to turn to the book of Hezekiah or the book of Samson. Some of you start to turn. That's right. If I would ask you your favorite book in the Bible, if you gave it to me, many of you would not know how many chapters there are in it. And some of you have never even read it through one time. And yet you say you believe it. We believe it generally, but we don't believe it specifically. We would not deny it. We're not cold. We just don't embrace it. We're not hot. We give lip service to it. Lukewarm about sanctification. Lukewarm about service. Lukewarm about the scriptures. And there's so many who are lukewarm about supplication and praying. How many of us really pray as we ought to pray? When's the last time you shed a tear over some soul that was mortgaged to the devil? We pray without fasting. When have you ever missed a meal to pray? When have you ever missed a night's sleep to pray? When is the time when you got alone and separated yourself from God and said, Oh God, I'm going to have a meeting with you and I'm going to pray until I know reality. I'm not going to get up from my knees until I make contact with heaven in a real way. 
the devil stands off and he laughs at our churches. He mocks at our schemes. He ridicules our organizations. He looks down upon our abilities. And the devil laughs up his sleeve at us and he says, all right, ha ha, you go ahead. You have your WMU, you have your brotherhood, you have your training union, you have your Sunday school, you have your Dr. Lane, you have your choir, you have your Adrian Rogers, you have your buildings, you have the rest of it. So long as you leave out the power of Almighty God that comes through earnest, persistent prayer that will not be denied. The devil trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. It is not that we deny prayer. Oh, we're not cold about it. It's just that we're not fervent in our prayers. The Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We're lukewarm about this matter of supplication. We're lukewarm about the matter of sacrifice. We sing a lot about sacrifice, but how much sacrifice do I know? How much sacrifice do you really know? Somebody says, well, God doesn't want us to die for Jesus today. That was back in yesteryear. Can you prove that? But let me tell you something, friend. You don't have to die for Christ to sacrifice for him. And how on earth are we going to get people to think about dying for the Lord Jesus Christ who don't even love him ten cents worth out of a dollar? Did you know that there are many who claim to love the Lord Jesus Christ, they claim to be saved, and they don't even tithe? I mean, they don't even tithe. They don't even love him a dime's worth out of a dollar. Oh, they sing good. They'll stand up in church and sing, Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. And they hold it with all their might. It's amazing, isn't it? Lukewarm about this matter of sacrifice. There's some of you who would not risk doing something or taking a stand that might cost you your job. Because it's your job first and Jesus second. We give so long as it doesn't hurt. So long as we have the things we want first, and then God gets the leftover. Our religion is a plaything. It makes God sick at his stomach. How many of us are lukewarm about soul winning? Or it's not that we don't want the saved, the unsaved to be saved, we do. But how many of you say, oh God, my heart will break unless you make me a soul winner? Oh dear friends, someone has said that we pray without fasting, we give without sacrifice, we witness without weeping. Is it any wonder that we sow without weeping? Oh, we are so half-hearted about it. Years ago, I heard a preacher tell a story of a lady. I don't know whether the story happened to him or to someone else, but he told about a, a lady who came to the evangelist, and she said, Sir, can you help me? I have two boys in my family. My two sons, they're old enough to be saved, and I have witnessed to them, and I have taken them to church, and I have read the Bible to them, and I have lived before them, and I have told them how to be saved, and my sons are not saved, and I'm burdened for my sons that they might be saved. The evangelist said, well, let me think about it. I'll come back tomorrow and tell you what I think. Let me pray over it. And then the evangelist did some checking up, and he asked other people, he said, uh, tell me about this woman. Is she a godly woman? They said, yes, she's a very godly woman. Does she live the right kind of life in front of her sons? Yes, she does. Does she pray? Yes. Is she in submission to her husband? Yes. Is she faithful to church? Yes, she is. Then the evangelist came back and said, Madam, I want to tell you why I believe that your sons are not saved. She said, tell me, I'm ready to listen to whatever you say as from God. He said, Madam, because your eyes are dry. It went like a dagger to her heart. She went home that night and she got down by her bed and she began to weep and cry and say, oh God, oh God, give me a broken heart for the unsaved souls of my sons. And she prayed and wept. And the next morning when she got up, she called her first son early to breakfast and said, Jimmy, I want to talk with you. She said, Jimmy, Mama's told you this before, but I want you to know, Jimmy, Mama wants you to be saved, not, not just for Mama's sake. Mama doesn't want you just to say yes and not mean it, but Mama wants you to know Jesus, Jimmy, as your personal Savior. Jimmy started to cry, and he said, Mama, I need to be saved, and I want to be saved, and Mama, help me, and she led him to Christ, and she was so happy, and she was so thrilled, and she went out and started to call Tom, and 
She said, Tom, come in here. Mama wants to talk to you. She said, Mama. He said, Mama, <laughs> you don't need to talk to me. I'm already saved. She said, how did you know what I want to talk to you about? He said, Mama, last night I passed by your room and I heard you crying and asking God to save me and Jimmy. I knew what you were talking to Jimmy about. I've already been out behind the barn. I've already gotten saved, Mama. And you don't have to talk to me. I, I know Jesus. Oh, friend, I, I would to God that we had some deacons that had a broken heart like that mother. I want God to give me that kind of a heart. Oh, I pray God that I'll never lose a broken heart for the souls of men. No, I want to be a flaming fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. So many of us, we look warm about our sanctification. We look warm about our service. We look warm about the scriptures. We look warm about our supplication. We look warm about our soul winning. And it makes God sick. What's so bad about lukewarmness? Have you ever noticed this verse? Look at it. Look at verse 15. God says here, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot, thou art neither cold nor hot. Now listen to this next one. I would, that is, I wish that thou wert cold or hot. Do you know what it says? God is saying, the Lord Jesus is saying, I had rather have you cold than have you lukewarm. Now, if I had my choice, I'd rather have you hot. But if I had to choose between your being cold and lukewarm, I'd rather have you cold. I'd rather have you out and out against me than pretending to be for me, than to be serving me half-heartedly. You say, well, now, wait a minute, Brother Rogers. That doesn't make sense. If a person is a lukewarm Christian, at least he's going to heaven. Wouldn't the Lord Jesus Christ rather have someone lukewarm and going to heaven than to have them out and out against him and going to hell? No! And I'll tell you why. It is the lukewarm Christian that's keeping so many people out of heaven. If we only had 10% of the Christians that name the name of Christ in the world today, and all of them were a flame of fire, all of them were living a separated life,
people are not going to commit sin against our Lord when they love him deeply, when they love him fervently. Do you remember we started this series of messages in the first church with the church at Ephesus? And remember the complaint that our Lord had against that church at Ephesus? Do you remember we preached this sermon, what to do when the glow is gone? What to do when the honeymoon is over? And the church at Ephesus seemed to be such a wonderful church, a magnificent church, a good church. But the Lord said, I have this against thee. You've left your first love. They didn't say you don't love me anymore. They did love him. They just didn't love him like they used to. Now that was the church at Ephesus. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven churches later, we come to the Laodicean church, which incidentally is the church that characterizes the last days. And now we see lukewarmness. First of all, they just, the teenage is growing cold, and now they're lukewarm. Had that church kept on in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, as they ought to have, they never would have gotten into this condition. And it is lukewarmness that gets you ready to commit other sins, worse sins, more horrible sins. And you need to understand, dear friend, that if this morning you don't have a burning, passionate, blazing, emotional, devoted love for the Lord Jesus, you set up for something worse that's going to betray the Lord Jesus and shame you and hurt those that you love. If there was ever a time that you love Jesus Christ more than you love him at this moment, to that degree, you are a backslider. Luke 1, oh, the shame of it. We've talked about the curse of it. Now let's talk about the cause of it. Look in verse 17. Because thou sayest, and here's the cause of it. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Their biggest need was to see their need. Do you know the problem today is this? That I'll preach this sermon on lukewarmness, and some of you will be saying, boy, I hope he tells them. Man, they need to hear that. That's good preaching. Boy, there might be some lukewarm people here today, and God is speaking to you. You may be a beacon. I want you to know I'm speaking to you, Dale Palmer. I'm speaking to you, Tommy Lane. I'm speaking to you, Tom Clayton. I'm speaking to me. I'm speaking to this choir, and I'm speaking to all of you. You may be thinking it's for someone else. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with good and have need of nothing, and knows not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And it's summed up in this sentence, thou sayest and knowest not. Their indifference was rooted in their ignorance. They said one thing, but they did not know. Our biggest need may be to see our need. I heard about a preacher who had a particular man in his congregation that he felt needed to get right with God. And so when the preacher would prepare his notes, he almost had a picture of that man sitting on his typewriter, a middle image, and he would think about that man, pray for that man, prepare for that man, and preach to that man. But the man would always meet the preacher at the door and say, Preacher, boy, you really hit him today. Oh, man, you really hit him today. That's good. Oh, you, you really gave it to him today. Preacher never could make him understand it was for him until one very snowy day, just he and that man showed up. The preacher and that man, and the preacher was ready. He had his message, and with all of the fire and vigor and unction and emotion of his soul, he preached to that one man. He said he can't miss it now. <laughs> he went to the door, ready to shake him out the door. He said, Preacher, if they had been here, you really would have given it to them today. I wonder if you're like that man. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You see, here's the ironic thing. Laodicea was noted for its wool, it was noted for its wealth, and it was noted for its medicine. It was a medical center. They had a very fine type of sheep there that gave shiny black wool, and the Laodicean garments were very beautiful. You see, he's going to make a contrast now between that. He says, I counsel thee to buy me white raiment that thou mayest be clothed as over against the black wool. And they, they, were, they were traders in, in, uh, in precious metals. It was a commercial center. And they, they, they thought they were very rich, but he says in this verse, in verse uh, 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And it was a medical center. And uh, they had a uh, problem with eyesight and, and so forth. And uh, uh, here at Laodicea was very precious ointment that was
was manufactured. And our Lord here ironically says, and you need to get salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Oh, <laughs> they thought they had it all, and they didn't have anything. That's the cause of lukewarmness, is the inability for us to see ourselves as God sees us. And oh, the, the problem is today that some of you will hear this message, but you won't hear it. That's the reason Jesus ended it by saying, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church is. Not the church, not just Laodicea. What he's saying to you now. Why is a little boy? One of the stories that our teacher told us in class that always amused me was the story of the emperor's clothes. Do you remember that story? <laughs> oh, there was a wealthy emperor who loved to dress up, and one day two con artists came into the city, and they told the king that they were going to weave for him an invisible suit of clothes. It cost him a fortune, but of course the king wanted it. And so they, they set up their make-believe looms and started weaving this invisible cloth. The king, in order to check up on them, sent two of his very wisest men over there. They were ashamed to admit that they couldn't see this invisible cross, so they pretended they saw it and came back and told the king how wonderful it was, and so forth. And finally, these uh, con artists came and dressed the king in nothing. And it was time for the king to appear in his new clothes. And he went out and paraded around the people in the all together. I mean, he didn't have anything on. He was dressed up in absolutely nothing. And everybody was told that these were the king's uh, a marvelous clothes, and anybody but a fool could see them. No one would admit what they were seeing the whole time. And everybody was praising the king's new clothes except for one little boy. And one little boy looked and said, why well, he got anything on at all. And then somebody else said it, and somebody else said it, and all around, finally, they could see that he was all together as naked as the day that he was born. But yet, the people went along carrying the invisible train behind his clothes, and he was too proud to admit that he didn't have any clothes on. Listen to this verse. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Do you know what's going to happen? Some people here dressed in the rags of their self-righteousness, and some of them, with less than that, are going to make fools of themselves before Almighty God because they have failed to hear the Word of God. Ignorance is the cause of indifference. Now let me talk with you next about the cure. The cure for lukewarmness. Look in verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Now lukewarmness is not weakness. It is wickedness. Some of you do not commit adultery. Some of you do not get drunk. Some of you do not steal. But if you're lukewarm, you can get ready for the judgment of God. Just as surely as this verse is in the Bible. Not because God doesn't love you. Because God does love you. God is too good to let you get by with your lukewarmness. You say, well, I've been lukewarm for years and God has never chastised me. Mister, you're not lukewarm, you're cold. You've never been saved. Oh, the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receiveth. God will not, God cannot, God never has, God never will let any true Christian get by with his coldness, his indifference, his lukewarmness. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, and this word zealous means be boiling. And repent. There's only one way to deal with your lukewarmness. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is repentance. Confess it to God. Get along with God. Get in some closet. Get on your knees. Get on your face before God. And say, God, have mercy upon me. Lord, I've insulted you. I've tried to be your child and yet not be excited and enthusiastic about you. God, have mercy upon my wickedness, my wretchedness. Oh, God. I want to be a flaming faggot of fire for you. Set my soul afire, Lord. Set my soul afire. Confess your lukewarmness as you would confess adultery. Confess it as you would confess blasphemy. It's a terrible sin. It's a horrible sin. The sin of lukewarmness. The cure is nothing less, nothing more, nothing but old-fashioned repentance before God. Now the message closes with a word to a saved person 
and a word to a lost person. Let's look at the word to the lost person. Look in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Some people say that Jesus is standing outside the door of that church and knocking. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a man. He's talking about an unsaved man in my estimation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, your life is like a house, like a kingdom. And Jesus Christ is on the outside knocking and wanting to come in, but you must open the door. Do you remember last week we talked on the church at Philadelphia and Jesus described himself there as the one who opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens? Remember that, the keeper of the keys and the doors of destiny? But there is one door with all that mighty power he will not pass open, and that is the door of your heart. And there he stands patiently knocking, patiently calling, patiently standing, waiting on you to open that door. Harmon Hunt painted that beautiful picture of Christ. You've seen it, Christ in the lantern. There he's standing knocking at the door. The vines have grown open the door. When the art critics first came and saw that painting, they said, Mr. Hunt, it is beautiful. But there's one thing you've forgotten. You put no doorknob on that door. He said, I did not forget it. He said, I did that way on purpose. The doorknob is on the inside. It must be open from the inside. And Jesus Christ today, the same Jesus that came into my heart, wants to come into your heart today. He does. Let me tell you about opening the door. First of all, it is a definite act. It is a definite act. You open the door. Just as you would go to the door of your house and open the door. I want you to definitely today, by faith, throw open the doors of your heart. Not only is it a definite act, it is a deliberate act. You can choose to do it. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, no one can do it for you. No one can keep you from doing it. And today you can open your heart to Jesus. For the Bible says, whosoever will may come. You say, what if he won't save me? What do you mean, what if he won't save you? He's standing at the door knocking. This sermon is Jesus knocking. The Holy Spirit is Jesus knocking. That wonderful psalm service was Jesus knocking. The time you had that near accident was Jesus knocking. That broken heart was Jesus knocking. That beautiful sunset was Jesus knocking. So many things, so many ways, over and over and over. Jesus is saying, I love you. I want to come in. But you must open the door. It is a definite act. It is a deliberate act. It is a delightful act. He says, if you open the door, I'll come in and sup with you. <laughs> Listen, I'm not inviting you to a funeral. I'm inviting you to a feast. If people understood what they had in the Lord Jesus Christ, you couldn't keep the door from the Mr. Listen, it's wonderful to know Jesus. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. But watch. I'll sup with him, and he with me. First he comes in to be the guest, and then he becomes the host. Isn't that wonderful? You know what he's saying? He is saying, you give me your all, and then you can have my all. I'll sup with you, but then you'll sup with me. Oh, dear friend, all by opening the door. That's the word to the unsaved. And the word to the saved is this. Look in verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. One of these days, dear friend, we're going to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, it pays to serve Jesus. It pays every day. It pays every step of the way. I want every head bowed and every eye closed, please. Father in heaven, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you will bless as we give this invitation. Lord, I pray that you'd help those of us who are Christians to repent of our coldness and lukewarmness. And oh, dear God, to have hearts that are aflame aglow with the love of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for those who've never ever been saved that they might right now, right now, definitely, deliberately, open the door and invite Jesus Christ into their heart. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed, no one stirring, no one looking around. How many here today would say, Brother Rogers, I know beyond a shadow of any doubt 
that I have invited Christ into my heart, and God bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. And I know if I would die right now, I'd go straight to heaven. May I see your hand? Hold it up. Many of you. Thank you. Put them down. How many would say, Brother Rogers, I couldn't lift my hand just then, but I want to know that I'm saved. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. And I am concerned about my soul. And in the prayer that you're about to pray, would you remember me in prayer? Now I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, whatever. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and this is between you and me and Jesus. But if you'd say, Brother Rogers, please pray for me. I am concerned about my soul. I need to be saved before it's everlastingly too late. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, would you just slip up your hand and then take it down? Hold it up. God bless you and you and you all. Oh, I see many of you. Others? Yes, up in the balconies. Yes, God bless you. Praise the Lord. Up in the top balcony. Yes. And over here on my right, lift your hand. Others? Yes, God bless you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Friend, is there anyone else? Prayer can't hurt you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm not embarrassed you. Yes, God bless you, son. I'll not point you out in any way. Those of you who are watching at home, I can't see your hand, but God can. Why don't you just lift your hand and say as he prays, Father, I want to be included in this prayer. Just lift your hand to heaven right now. How many of you would say, Brother Rogers, I am saved and I know it, but I'm not a member of Bellevue. Would you pray with me that as a Christian I would know and do God's will about my church membership? May I see your hand? Just lift it up. Yes. Praise God. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, I fervently and sincerely pray for these who've lifted their hands. Lord, help those who said they're not saved to understand now, Lord, that they can be if they'll trust Christ, Spirit of the living God. Help them to understand that Jesus died for them in agony and blood on the cross, that they might now be freely forgiven, and that they might be saved. And Lord, help them to receive Christ. And bless these, Lord, who may need to transfer their church membership. Lead them and help them to, the Father, to do what they ought to do, to set the example for these that are lost. Lord, I place the invitation now in your holy hands in the name of Jesus. Amen. Look at me. Those of you, those of you who lifted your hands and you said, I'm not saved, but I need to be saved. Are you willing to pray a prayer like this? Oh, God, I'm lost. And I can't save myself, and I, I need to be saved. And right now, Lord Jesus, I open my heart, and I receive you by faith as my Savior and Lord. Are you willing to do that? If you are, the Lord will save you. You don't have to pray those words. It's not those words. It's the attitude of your heart that counts. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. If you're willing, look right at me now. No one's stirring. If you're willing to give your heart to Jesus, when we stand and sing in a moment, I want those of you who lifted your hand and others of you who may not have lifted your hand, but you know in your heart that you need Jesus, I'm going to ask you to leave your seat and come forward. There will be someone standing at the head of each of these aisles. They're standing there to receive you. They're a minister of our church. You say, Brother Rogers, what should I say when I come forward? Just tell that man I'm trusting Christ or I want to trust Christ. Use your own words. It really doesn't make any difference how you say it, if you mean business with God. There's something about coming forward that settles it and seals it and shames the devil and gives glory to God. Those of you who are watching by television, you can't come forward in this service, but we've arranged for you to call on the telephone, and someone will have a prayer of confirmation with you if you want to receive Jesus. Call the number given to you. Call it right now. Someone's waiting to receive your call and to pray with you and to help you to make this decision today. Those of you who said, Brother Rogers, I'm not a member of the 